Have you ever seen something get completely outweighed by its successors? It doesn't necessarily mean that the original thing is bad, just that it got drowned out by what came later for one reason or another. Of course you have. Well, that's my story with Zerum and its prequel, Iria Zerum the Animation. The anime became something of a cult hit in the anime community, but I feel like the movie that started the franchise doesn't get anywhere near as much love. And I guess, on a much, much smaller scale, you could say something similar's happened with me reviewing Keita Amemiya's later works before this one. Well, I'd like to make up for my past sins by taking a look at the original Zerum. Or Zeram, whichever you prefer. Zerum's story begins with an alien named, uh, Zerum, escaping from containment and heading to Earth. A bounty hunter named Iria and her AI partner Bob also head to Earth to set up a pocket dimension called a zone that they intend to trap the alien in. But they have to steal electricity to do it, which prompts two bumbling electricians named Tepe and Kamiya to investigate. They end up ruining Iria's plans and get trapped in the zone with the newly arrived Zerum. Well, now it's up to Iria to get them out and capture the alien or else she'll either lose out on some space moolah or get taken to space court. And that's basically it. It's not a complex plot, but that's not a problem if the characters are strong enough, monster included. Luckily, the characters are pretty enjoyable here. Zerum itself, if you can really consider it a character, is a destructive force that only really cares about eating and assimilating the DNA of anything that gets in its way. It can also use the assimilated DNA to make subservient clones, and this, combined with its multiple form changes, makes it an unpredictable threat that's fun to watch. The one thing standing in its way is Iria, a tough-as-nails bounty hunter who's basically the closest you're ever going to get to a live-action Samus. Not counting those commercials. She's badass, and I love her. Possibly a little too badass. So the movie's way of having the antagonist stay threatening is... these bozos. Tepe and Kamiya will probably make or break this movie for a lot of viewers. Personally, I think they're likable. Their banter is fun even when something crazy isn't going on, which there usually is. But of course, they're complete morons when it comes to all this alien malarkey unfolding in front of them. And they're initially a huge burden for Iria. This movie could have ended an hour sooner with her sealing Zerum in a whack-ass crystal prison if these guys didn't immediately screw everything up. But their skills from their job do end up being a huge asset for her later, and by the end it feels like they've all formed a very genuine friendship from this experience. They all end up learning something from each other, and it's nice to watch them grow in such a short time span, and the actors really sell it. The visuals are where this movie shines. The main inspiration for Zerum's design was Keita Amemiya's desire to make a resilient, constantly changing monster like the Terminator, coupled with an epiphany that it would be scary to see a man wearing Edo period clothing in modern day Japan, which... Yeah, I guess that would be pretty scary. But its silhouette is where the similarities to an Edo period traveler end. It may look like something familiar, but it's still very much an alien. The design clearly has DNA from a lot of western movie monsters like Alien, Predator, and The Thing, while still feeling very distinct from all those things. This melding of traditional eastern imagery with western sci-fi is a bit of a staple of Ame Mia's work, as we saw last time. I love the light-up visor, the tiny no-theater-inspired face that acts as a living tongue, and the mushroom-like hat that turns out to be a lot more than a hat. The stop motion and puppetry for later mutations are also pretty wild, and the contrast with the suit from earlier cements this alien as an adaptable threat. It looks unreal, and that's what I like about it. I kinda wish the clones it made were a little bit more diverse though. It's a cool ability, but the clones are kinda just gross blob people. It would have been nice to see something a little bit crazier. And while the movie is named after it, this isn't all about Zerum. The designs for Iria's outfit and technology are pretty awesome too. Cloaks are always stylish, and hers is no exception. And while the armor she dons after removing it looks kinda plain at first, she's no space sheriff, the special effects really sell it as this big power-up. I love old rotoscoped effects, and they make this armor seem like one of the coolest things ever. I also like the simplistic CGI used for Bob and everything he displays on his screen. If this early 90s CGI were being swapped for real props, it'd be a little intrusive, but it's perfect for this. 
Iria's weapons are also notable because they're a bunch of parts from real weapons Frankenstein together, so while this gun doesn't look quite the same as any real world gun, it's still very recognizable as a gun. Iria and Bob's arsenal continues Zerum's theme of blending familiar and unfamiliar imagery, but the approach here is different. The setting isn't as wild as, say, Hokkaider. It's basically just a regular 90s Japanese city, except most of the movie takes place in a pocket dimension called a zone. Everything looks the same as before, but surrounded by invisible walls, and nobody's there except Iria, the electricians, and Zerum. At first I thought it was an unnecessary element, and I assumed it was just a holdover from the initial pitch where this whole thing took place in a video game. But it does add a sort of loneliness to the location. What would normally be bustling city streets becomes a monster's desolate hunting ground. I also like the look of Iria and Bob's makeshift base. It's a small room with a bunch of electronics cobbled together, both from a production and in-universe standpoint. It also has a sense of loneliness to it, like it'll only provide a short moment of safety from the monster. The soundtrack is really fitting overall. Koichi Ota and Nakaji Kinoshita leave a score that delivers the perfect move, with instrumentation that feels distinct. For example, the trying to run away from a monster theme sounds just like that. And its title translates to run away appropriately enough. The track that plays when Eerie is trying to lead Zerum into a trap has an appropriate sense of urgency to it. And I love nothing more than tooting my own horn, but as much as I love horror in any form, I don't tend to get scared by it easily. But the opening sequence with Zerum slaughtering the prison guards becomes downright unsettling when accompanied by Sohon's on Komiyoji's sutras. The sutras tend to play whenever the monster's on screen and they make it so much stranger and scarier. This combined with the clanging sound of its footsteps also make it something I really wouldn't want to be chased by. <laughs> And if you need some more examples to prove that the soundtrack is good, well, that's what you've been listening to the whole time. The English dub gets the gist of things right, with my main complaint being that the names are slightly different for seemingly no reason. The most glaring one is the name of Zerum, and also the movie's title being changed to Zeram. I, I don't get it. Was that I making this movie less marketable somehow? Then again, I'm not sure if we should trust these guys' idea of marketability considering the tagline was sci-fi that reaches out and grabs you, which frankly sucks ass, especially if your movie isn't even 3D. But anyway, Iria's name seems to now be Ilya and Tepe is Tepe. Since Kamiya's name is pronounced either Kamiya or Kamiya now, it's possible that these actors just weren't used to pronouncing names like this, so I'm willing to let it slide. These actors by and large had a good bit of experience with dubbing, so they did fine here. My other big gripe is Bob's voice. It sounds like it was digitally lowered, which is probably to emphasize that he's not human, but it just makes him sound evil. He's supposed to be Eerie's helpful AI buddy, he doesn't need to sound scary. It's also pretty hard to understand him sometimes. I've set up the battle parameters with your exact combat profile in mind. Once he's inside the zone, if we can get the field around him, it's all over. And here's the best part. If we get the zone set up before he arrives, he won't even know he's stepping into a trap. You have to admit it's better than your approach, which involves a lot of messy Bob, battles. Can you please shut up? Overall, I prefer the Japanese voice track, but the English dub still has character for sure. In a 1992 interview with Keita Amemiya and Yuko Moriyama, Amemiya says that his goal with this movie was to make a fun film that the audience would enjoy. I think he really succeeded in this goal, and in case you couldn't already tell, I recommend it. If you look in the right places, you can get this movie on DVD on its own for about $10, or bundled with the sequel for about $20. That's in US dollars, by the way. And I'd say those are reasonable prices. It's not going to look like this. It's going to look like this, but I don't have a problem with that the first time around. Zerum 2's DVD release does look way worse, but we'll get into that another time. The footage I've been using is from the non-subtitled Blu-ray set, which is over $100, so I don't recommend buying that. Now we'll just have to pray for a western release. It sure would be swell if there were a way to watch the Blu-ray version with subtitles without paying $100. Anyway, Amemiya concludes the previously mentioned interview by saying that he wanted future installments where Iria takes the center stage in a more unique setting. 
Well, that actually did end up happening, and we'll be peeping them sometime soon. Alright, so I guess that is the end of another video. Thank you for watching, and remember to like, comment, subscribe, and hit 